was going to break down, and he decided to come to Turkey. That's when I personally first heard of him, you see, was in the middle of 1920. It was then that I heard of him in that strange way in my job as I was the chief of the um, intelligence for the army of the Black Sea or the, on the political side. I used to get all the time dispatches from India as to people that had to be watched who were coming out and I simply got a dispatch saying a very dangerous Russian agent by name George Gurdjieff was arriving in Istanbul. Would I keep an eye on him? That's the first I ever heard of him. And quite independently of that, I was invited by my very dear friend, Prince Abahidin, who was the nephew of the Sultan, to go and visit him and meet a man. It turned out it was Gurdjieff, who Sultan, uh, so, so Prince had known before the war, before 1914. That's how my first personal contact with him. Uh, I have no doubt at all that Gurdjieff was, in fact, an agent of the Tsarist government. I think that's how he was able to travel, how he was able to get into the debt, how he had all sorts of facilities given him. You were asking me about his travels. Uh, he was partly facilitated, I think, by that. The Russian government, he had, he does hint of this in his own book, Meetings with Remarkable Men, that he was quite willing to take on political assignments if they could get into places he wanted to visit. I mean, he regarded as, as any means that would legally get him to a place as, as one to be adopted. Evil has said that he was also a Marxist agent. He himself did say whether it's true or not, I have no means of knowing that he actually was at the seminary with Stalin and that he'd known Stalin as a boy. It seemed to me highly improbable, but I've heard him say it myself several times. Um, but that he... I'm reasonably satisfied. No, I'm, I'm more than satisfied. I don't believe for a moment he was ever a, an agent of the communist government of Russia because he left Russia um, before Georgia turned communist. At the time he left Georgia, 19, July 1920, uh, there was still the social democratic government in Georgia. Then he went to Istanbul. Why did he come further west? Was it for ideological reasons? Or did he have to flee? No, he did not have to flee. He could certainly have stayed in Istanbul. He had plenty of support there. He, after all, he was at that time Istanbul was had an enormous Greek and Armenian population, and he could have stayed there, and it would have been he would have kept a link with his homeland. After all, he was only days' journey from the, from the Kast, where his mother still was. Or not in, in not cast but Alexandrople. I think that he made the great decision that he had to go to the West because he thought his work would best be appreciated and he'd do the most useful work there. And I think that he was convinced that the esoteric tradition was going to flower in the West and that it was his mission to to sow the seeds, and that that's what he came to it. If that's what you mean by yes. ideological, yes, I would say that is so. We know that when he came to England, the Home Office refused permission for him to stay here. Yes, but I think that was more because he was a, a Russian agent. You know, we, we make a sharp distinction between czarists and communists, but Russia is Russia, and Russia for a, a, a long time been intent upon controlling the Central Asia, and and we at that time, after all, were still the British Empire. We did not want the Russians to control Central Asia, which we also had some eye on at that time, so there was this enormous conflict between British Raj and the Russian Empire. Therefore, anyone who would be acting for the Russians would, even after the collapse of the the Tsardist regime still be looked upon as someone to be watched. So he moved on? He went to Berlin first, and then he went to 
Then he came to London, then he went to Paris. Did he then move nearer to the Christian faith? Well, he was brought up as a Christian. He worked for the time even to uh, think of entering the priesthood. He was always very outspoken in his criticism of institutional religion, Christian, Muslim, any. Uh, he, he always said that the church had completely uh, destroyed the original message of Christ and that to understand one had to think outside the categories of Christian dogma in order to understand what Christ really stood for. That he was very firm about. He always regarded Christianity as, a, um, as essentially as a, as a truth. In, his, in one of the lectures I heard him give at the prayer in 1923, he said, the aim of my institute is to enable people to be Christians. I said, you but you must understand that people, there are three kinds of people. There are those who think they're Christians and don't know anything about it. There are those who really want to be Christians. And there are people who are able to be Christians. My job is to get the people who want to be Christians and show them how they can be Christians. I and mean, that was the way he spoke about it. But you must understand he was, he was very much at home with Islam. A great many of his teachers had been Sufis. He'd met with Sufi brotherhoods in or Tariqat in different parts, right from Turkey, right away through right away through to, to Xinjiang, to Chinese Turkestan. When he got to the West, how did he manage to connect groups of people around him? Well, he got he had this remarkable man, P.D. Uspensky, who, whom he met in 1915 in, in Moscow. He, then he met Alexander Saltzman, the great stage designer, about the same time, and Hartmann, the composer and friend of Skriabin. They're quite, they're quite outstanding, interesting people, and of course people like that would have others following them. Then when he came to to Turkey, he met some people there. Then he, when he came to England, Uspensky had preceded him. He'd come here through Lady Rothermere, as like everyone knows. And Uspensky had two main groups, of, two main sources. One was the, the psychoanalysts, the people of the unions who were looking beyond psychoanalysis. They were Dr. Modis. No, Nickel wasn't in it at the very first, but Raj and several other. Then Nickel soon afterwards joined. So there was that group, and then there were the Theosophists. I remember particularly Maud Hoffman and the man who, what, who wrote the fragments of a faith forgotten, the G.R.S. Mead. You know, those people came from that group, and that was where Spinsky got his people. And they, in turn, brought in some quite influential and some very rich people who helped Gurdjieff to found his institute. Gurdjieff's institute in Paris depended very much upon English money. He had very little support from the French. They couldn't understand what he was after. He had all his imprecision and his contradictoriness and, and so on was very alien to the Gallic mind, but much more acceptable to ours. What do you think is his standing in the world of ideas today? Like most great innovators, he dropped out of sight after his death, and there's now a growth of interest, which is especially in the United States quite extraordinary, and then a great number of imitators, and People who never met him, never even met one of his own personal pupils, were setting themselves up to teach his teaching and basing themselves on what they find in books. So that there are literally tens of thousands of people interested in Gurdjieff's work. Maybe you must realize that the Gurdjieff followers are not a mass movement. There are probably all over the world between eight and 10,000 people who are specifically 
regarding themselves as followers of Gurdjieff's ideas. Only perhaps a third of these are organized with pupils of Gurdjieff at the head, but many people have become interested in Gurdjieff's ideas. I know myself of quite a large number of American universities where they have courses on Gurdjieff and also Spensky's ideas. I get letters from professors asking me questions and referring to various books and I judging from this I think that the interest is considerable. I'm not mentioning any names but there's one person whom I would like to refer to and that is Dr. Fritz Schumacher, the author of the book on intermediate technology. He came in contact with Gurdjieff's ideas about 25 years ago, not long after Gurdjieff died, and I myself had many meetings with him at that time. He's one of the world's greatest working economists. He did a great deal to establish the successful running decentralization of the National Coal Board with Lord Robins in this country and afterwards was economic advisor to the government of Burma. He undoubtedly has uh, grasped some of the basic ideas of Gurdjieff's teaching, particularly as they affect ecology and the relationship of man to nature. And I think that with his work and the work of quite a number of other people who are similarly inspired by Gurdjieff's doctrine of reciprocal maintenance are playing a quite important part in uh, preparing the way for a new, new kind of society here, a society based on decentralization and a quite different connection between man and nature. It is just what Gurdjieff constantly was teaching us as being necessary if man was to survive on this earth. Of course, of psychologists also, there are many, and Gurdjieff psychology is taught by professors in, not only in Europe and America, but also in Eastern countries. I know the University of Sin, my friend, Professor Hardiput, who gives courses in Gurdjieff psychology. And so I think that the one can say that Gurdjieff's ideas are spreading. They are not written about very much in books, but people are teaching them, applying them in practice, and that to an increasing extent. But I think it's important here to make a distinction between two attitudes toward any kind of teaching and very much to Gurdjieff's, that is what I would call the esoteric attitude and the open attitude. The esoteric view is that the traditional teaching is essentially a secret, it is for the few, it is not to be divulged to the profane and that it is the duty of those to whom it's entrusted to preserve it for the future and they essentially look upon themselves as preservers and they only make available what is what is required at any given time. And there is, of course, another, another aspect of the esoteric view, and that is that only few are capable of following the path, and that, there, that this doctrine of election can be pushed to extreme, that many are called, but few are chosen, can be interpreted to mean that few are very few. This is the real extreme esoteric view, and it's a very comforting view. I mean, if you once feel you're inside, it's lovely to be able to look out <laughs> and look up at all the cohorts of the damned who will never get there. But the other, uh, that is the extreme esoteric and rather egoistic attitude, I think. But there's another much more serious and much more valid thing, and that is that, 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 that the teaching can so easily be distorted that one has to be very careful not to, to divulge it to people 
who will be liable to misuse it, especially if the teachings not only theoretical but contain practical 